when the teacher's running a few minutes behind you, don't want to come in after him because then he'll point you out and shift the blame from him. All right, let's be open our Bibles to Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> there is um, an illness running through the congregation. Um, and Ron and Jeremiah's had the stomach bug, and they're over it now. They're just still weak, so they may try to be here tonight. Um, Sarah has it. Travis called this morning and said, he's not doing well today. And then the Kemp's are staying home today just to kind of, they think they may have the flu in their two kids, so they don't want to spread that to anybody. And... Um, if I seem a bit standoffish, I woke up this morning with my tummy having some interesting conversations with me. Um, and so I'm not going to shake any hands today, just to be precautious. I have Germexed my hands pretty good, but um, I don't like to be blamed for anything. So. <laughs> Anyway, I did, I did want you to know, because Curtis, he went and shake my hand, and I would just kind of wave my hand up, walked right on by, and didn't have a chance to tell him that I wasn't ignoring him. So, Okay, so in Acts chapter 2, we had finished Acts chapter 1 last week and had done the questions um, in the work booklet. <clears throat> Before we begin with our study today, let's go to Heavenly Father in a word of prayer. Our dear Lord, most righteous and almighty Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many wonderful blessings that you've given to us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your grace and for your mercy and your loving kindness. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we have to come together to study your word. We pray that our hearts and our minds will be established within what your word has to say. And Heavenly Father, we pray that we will be able to strengthen our lives as your children, having even a better understanding of what is taught within your word and what was established by your son. We have many in the congregation who are sick and facing various ailments. We ask Heavenly Father that you'll please continue to watch over them and be with them. And we pray that if it be your will, they'll be brought back to the fullest portion of their health. These things we pray in your son's most holy name. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> so starting here in Acts chapter 2, we continue or pick up with what we were looking at last week. What we don't know in the text here is how much time has passed. Now, it could have been a lot of time because there's only 10 days from when Jesus ascended up into heaven to the time to the day of Pentecost. All right, because he was on earth with the apostles for 40 days. Then he ascended into heaven. Pentecost is 50 days after the Passover where Jesus had been crucified that Friday before. And so, having spent 40 days with his apostles, he ascended up into heaven. So, we have a span of 10 days. And in the course of this time period, as we looked at last week, they, found a, a, they appointed a replacement for Judas there picking Matthias. Um, and at this particular gathering, there was 120 disciples that were present. Now, like I said, this took place during the 10 days. We don't know exactly when during the 10 days. Many times when we start Acts chapter 2, many individuals place it on the same day as the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 verse 1. And they put 120 people, 120 disciples being present with the apostles. And so um, they say then the Holy Spirit came upon all 20 of them and not just the 12. But when you, as we read down through chapter 2, you'll find that the Holy Spirit will come upon only the 12. Um, and so strongly suggest that this was not the same setting as where Matthias, Matthias was chosen, but maybe a day or so later after that. All right, so any thoughts or comments as we begin Acts chapter 2? Yes, ma'am. Sure. Sure, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Now he has to get permission uh, 
from the Holy Spirit um, to give his apostles commandments to, uh, I guess, to stay there in Jer Jerusalem until the, the power of the Holy Spirit affects them, the power of the Holy Spirit has. But I thought it was kind of strange that he would not just do that on his own. Some of his disciples are given commandments to stay there. Maybe I read it wrong or something. Well, he, he, he does do that. Um, and the latter part of Luke chapter 24, he opens the eyes of the apostles and gives them a greater understanding. Um, Luke chapter 24, there in verse 45, and he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Okay. Um, the question... I, I, I worded the question a little bit off because Jesus is telling them that they would. Hang on a minute here. Um, I'm going to get this right. That he would give them commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen by the Holy Spirit. And that would happen on the day of Pentecost. So that event doesn't happen in chapter 1. It's just Jesus tells them that it would happen to them. So he doesn't get permission from the Holy Spirit. He actually will send the Holy Spirit to them. As the Father will likewise send the Holy Spirit to them. Now, class is just getting started. Do we want to answer that question? I'm sorry. It's, it's a very, inter it's very challenging question. The, our basic understanding is that, that there's one God, but we see three persons within him. It's not truly the Trinity idea that oftentimes is taught, but there seems to be, because remember when Jesus was baptized by John, the Father spoke from above, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, hear him, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him like as a dove. So we see the three functioning separately, if that makes sense. So from a human standpoint, Jesus tells his apostles that the Father will send the Spirit of truth, and then he'll say a little bit later, I will send the Spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit. It seems to me like There is an equality in that Philippians chapter 2 explains that when Jesus came to this world, he didn't do it because he thought it was robbery to be equal with God. In other words, Jesus didn't come to this earth because he can't be equal with God. He, he, he is deity with God. Yeah. But when he's in the flesh, he is doing the will of the Father and speaking what the Father would have him to speak because he's in the flesh. Like I said, it's a very interesting discussion. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts or comments? Okay, let's go ahead and jump into chapter 2 here. And it is a good question, um, because Jesus didn't have to get permission from the Holy Spirit. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to do the task. Yeah. Um, and this is what was prophesied by Joel, as we'll talk about a little bit later here in the text there. So let's go ahead and read verses 1 through 4, and then we'll have the discussion here. So when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were with all of one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, what is very interesting here within the first four verses that we have looked at is that it doesn't come right out and tell us who the they were initially. All right? When 
the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And that's why people look back to the previous chapter and conclude that it was the 120. But when you look down at verse 14, and we'll get to this a little bit later here in this morning's study, but look down in verse 14, Peter stands up with the 11, raised his voice and said to them, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Verse 11 helps us understand who the they were. There was Peter and the 11 who were present there. So that kind of helps to kind of feel, to kind of answer that question there of who were the they. It was the 11. It was Peter and the 11, or as it were, the 12 apostles. It's Kyle. Okay, that is a very good point, um, and one we'll talk about here a little here in a few minutes. I think that's a very very good point because I want to emphasize something here. What's happening on this day of Pentecost isn't something as simple as oh, God is going to give the apostles a few more words to say, because the Holy Spirit had already helped them when they went out on the limited commission. And when Jesus was with them in Luke chapter 24, Jesus opened their minds. And so it's not that he's simply going to give them a little bit more information. This is something that Joel said was going to happen. And it wasn't fulfilled with the limited commission. It wasn't fulfilled in Luke chapter 24. This was something that's being fulfilled on this day when the Spirit of the Lord is poured out on all flesh. And so we'll talk about that as we get through here, because what is about to happen, these people are seeing only the 12 do what they're doing. But in the following days, it's going to quickly expand to many more doing what they're doing. And so we'll, we'll, go, we'll go a little farther with that as, as we get there. But that is a very good point. That is what Joel said. And Peter said, this is what's happening this day. All right, let's see. In the manifestation of this miracle, uh, visually it is described as coming upon them, a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they're all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. So without a doubt, this is something different. It had not happened before. The apostles, those who were witnessing this, saw the cloven tongues appear up over the heads of the apostles, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Had they spoken with the Holy Spirit before? Yes, on the limited commission. But this wasn't the same thing. Something stronger and something even greater and a fulfillment of prophecies we'll talk about a little bit later here. Um, the key thing is, and they all began to speak as the Spirit gave them what? Utterance, okay, that's very important to kind of keep in mind there. They all began to speak as the Spirit gave them utterance. That is, the apostles were speaking. And the method of speaking was through that of speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues is something pretty simple in, in principle. Speaking in tongues is speaking in another language. Okay, it's very straightforward, another language there. Um, now, this example tells us that is, the speaking in tongue is in speaking in a language that is understandable. It's just that the speaker doesn't understand it. In other words, it would be, um, well, as a little bit later here, some of the observation is the people are amazed because they hear the apostles talking to them in their own tongues, that is, from their native homelands, but yet they know these men are Galileans. How come that's happening. Well, that's what we mean by another language. When you uh, jump forward in time to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul talks about the rules regarding using the speaking of tongues and services. Um, if, you if, if the Holy Spirit moves someone with the gift of speaking in tongues, he could only speak in tongues if what was present. Yep, someone who could interpret, okay? 
Um, and someone, and Paul will go on to say that basically speaking in tongues isn't for the benefit of the majority. It's for the benefit of the unbeliever. It would be better to have the gift of prophecy, to be able to speak knowledge and be able to understand it. And so this idea of the gift of speaking in tongues was going to be for a twofold purpose. It's going to make it possible for them to take the truth to the lost, not being able to speak their language, they will now be able to, and two, it will demonstrate the power of God and therefore the authority behind their message. Um, and we'll see this develop as we go through here. Any thoughts or any comments? Yes. Exactly. It needs, the word must be understandable. The, the, a modern day equivalent, let's say if we were to take us and put us back then, um, would be um, the Holy Spirit moving someone to speak in Albanian. And none of the members here speak Albanian. So you'd have no idea what the person was saying. So there's no edification. But someone with the gift of speaking in tongues could then translate, he's what, here's what he's saying. And, and the, the problem with it being some sort of angelic tongue is that there is no way of verification. You know, we, we, at least with, with, with tongue speaking being in an actual language, that, and although the Bible doesn't lay this out, this is from more of a reasoning standpoint, that can be verified. You can record what's being said and find a translator, and they can translate it without a problem. But if it's something that's more ethereal in what is being spoken, then how can man ever know that it's truly from God? Well, take this guy's word for it. Well, it's not like there's been any deceivers in the church. I mean, it's, it, 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 go, it, it, it sounds good, like what you're saying. It's kind of an emotional buildup and everything. But when you look at the scriptures, it was only done for one reason, to teach two reasons and to confirm. Yeah, how? Well, 
let's talk about that for a minute. Um, we'll, we'll read through this here too. There, now, there is a, a, a belief, and, and some members of the church hold this, and, and um, I don't agree with it, but it could be the case, where the miracle is on the part of the hearer, where the apostles only spoke in their regular tongues, but God enabled, the Holy Spirit enabled the people to hear in their own languages. Um, it could have been, except the fact that in this case in point, the working of the Holy Spirit was on the 12th, not on, on the multitude. Now, with that being said, only 3,000 of those who were present heard and were convicted by the truth. You know, so, now, let us go ahead, let's go ahead and read the text, though. It, it makes for a little bit um, a little, more, a little more, more clarity on the discussion. Um, any other thoughts before we go on? Miss Patty. speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God, what they're hearing the apostles teach. Yeah. Um, well, let's, go ahead, let's go ahead and read through here. He says they're continuing in verse 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that each that we hear each in our own language in which we were born. Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phigra and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Uh, thanks, Kelvin. That lazy here on the flipper. And then verse 12, so they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? And verse 13, others mocking said, they are full of new wine. All right, what we have here in the text is strictly what happened. I mean, anything else beyond that is going to be speculation. And I guess there's always a possibility that uh, my understanding of it could be a little bit off um, then than what is actually, then maybe what actually did happen. But a couple observations here. We have 12 people talking, 12 apostles talking, but not just 12 apostles talking. But what happened when, when the, the events that are described in the first four verses took place, was it pretty noisy? It was very noisy, wasn't it? So much so, and they were and they're dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews devout men from every nation. When the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused. All right, so we're not sure about what caused the confusion. Obviously, the, the noise did. But we have the 12 apostles beginning to speak. Now, it could be, as what was pointed out earlier, um, that everybody, in a very literal fashion, was hearing in their own language. But I would suggest that what's going on here is that all 12 apostles are speaking. And each one is speaking in an assigned language. Okay. And so if you've got 12 men speaking in different languages... You know, imagine if you were to have 12 different languages being spoken at one time. Imagine while I'm speaking, if there were 11 other like men in, in sync with me and speaking in other languages the same things that I'm speaking, it would sound a bit confusing. So you're standing there and you hear, now wait a minute, that fellow right there, I, I, that's my language. And so, well, I, I hear this guy, he's talking in my language. What might have happened, and this is a scholar, this is scholar speculation, not what the Bible says. Scholars speculate that what happened here in the temples, the temple would have had smaller rooms with, uh, on the outside of the, or the outskirts of the temple. Uh, think about community rooms at banks and motels and stuff like that. Maybe something along those lines. And what ended up happening is the apostles probably divided the people up. People would have gathered around this apostle who was speaking their language. People would have gathered around this apostle who was speaking this language. Now, this is all speculation. But it very well could have worked in this fashion. But initially, 12 men all speaking the same truth, but in different languages, could create this kind of a confusing air a little bit about that. Um, let's go to Kyle and then to Junior. So, as I've seen this, it, it actually would make perfect sense for them to be speaking languages, each language. And I think what is they're saying these people are drunk about is 
what the message is. I think that it's like, hey, well, no, this can't be true. What are they talking about? We killed the Son of God? You know, like, these guys are drunk. And I think it's more like, no, you know, this is, he said the Spirit was going to come upon you. And now listen, Jesus of Nazareth was the man accredited by God, and that's what he's teaching. And he, I, the, it's not about, oh, I, I don't understand what's being said. It's more like, oh, I don't believe that. These guys are just like talking out of the mind. I yeah. think that, and I remember one over this before, I apologize. I, I can see that. Very clear. Well, and the, the concept of it being the, the message that some were saying prompted the drunk statement is just as viable. Yeah, very, yeah. Um, Junior. Could it be just like that when they were going to the Tower of Hell and they were talking about the Son of God and they were talking about the language that everyone that knew, okay, I went to this person, they were speaking something different. So I'll find someone that's speaking the same thing. I'm speaking that person I go with. Yeah. And many times I come to the day of Pentecost. The apostles spoke to these, these different nations of herds in their own language uh, concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, like I said, if we have a picture of, 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 of uh, another nation speaking the same thing you're speaking, you may be speaking in a different language with other people. Here, here's the gospel. This is you are teaching to us the gospel. We're here in our, our own language. Yeah, yeah. I, that, to me, it kind of fits. Yeah. Uh, Blake and then Dale. The other thing I thought about was that when they say they're, you know, they're drunk or they're full of new wine, is um, maybe the idea of, uh, like, if you're at like a, like a gathering of people or whatever, there, where like drinking is involved, uh, or like not even necessarily uh, with, like with or without alcohol there, uh, like the idea that you, know, you hear a lot of noise going on, a lot of people talking, a lot of people talking over each other having conversations at the same time, but not necessarily, you know, being able to make sense of all of it. So it might have even been as simple of an observation as these people are drunk because they're all just talking over each other. Could be too. Could be. Yeah. Hence the, the, the what they thought was behind the confusion. Yeah. Dale. There's something to think about here. You got twelve apostles. They're all speaking in a language other than their you have all of these different languages here, which if you can imagine the size of the crowd here. There wasn't a uh, microphone and speakers or anything. Peter himself could not be speaking to the whole group, even though you look at verse 14. It says Peter standing up with the apostles. So imagine that all these groups are here and they're in different languages and there's one apostle with each one of these groups speaking in their language. The sermon that Peter is preaching here in Acts chapter 2 is the same sermon that they're preaching to the others at the same time. They're all receiving the exact <coughs> same message. Yeah. And so we see down in verse 30, uh, verse 41, about 3,000 souls were added to the church that day. Generally, back in those days, it was just the men that was counted. So if you assume that 3,000 men, but there were women and there were children there as well. So imagine the size of this group. Peter did not speak to all of them at once. Right. But we had the same message. Going about the whole group. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so what And so what we see then, when we lead up to this point, you have this, and, and, and I think what we're about to read in verse 14 was at the beginning of this mass confusion, you know, trying to get everybody to realize what's truly going on. And um, Peter's about to establish in their minds what's truly taking place this day. And undoubtedly, the others who were speaking would have shared with the same information. But here, here's something else to keep in mind, that during this first century, this, this Roman um, era of time, People, there was a common language called Koine Greek that most everybody spoke. It'd be like English. You know, there's a lot of countries you go to, and you're going to find people that speak English. Um, but then everybody had their own native tongues. And so it's very possible that when Peter began to speak in verse 14, 
He may have been speaking in the language that everybody who could hear him would understand. And like Dale said, you got a large number of people. So unless Peter found some elevated area and began to shout this, he was probably speaking to the immediate group who was saying, you know, they're drunk and so forth, whoever was around him at this time. But it would have been a message, though, that would have gone out throughout the whole of the people so they would understand. Um, so let's go ahead and look at the next section here. So this is what Peter does. He stands up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And here is the, the quote, the prophecy. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So let's pause there for just a moment. What, where is this prophecy found in Joel? Joel chapter 2. Around verses 28 through 32 would be the area of the prophecy there. Um, and Peter I clearly identifies it as a messianic prophecy or post-messianic prophecy. See, that there, there were two different types of prophecies, and when we did our Isaiah study, we, we, we saw this a good bit. There were some prophecies that referred to the coming of the Messiah and would ultimately end with his death. Isaiah 53 is an example of that. Psalms 22 ultimately is a prophecy of the victory of, of the Messiah. But then other prophecies talked about now the Messiah reigning in his kingdom. We saw this a lot in our study of Isaiah. Isaiah would say, you know, now this is what's going on, but a time will come where the kingdom of God's people will be, and, and so we see these great prophecies. Joel is talking about a day that is after the death of the Messiah, the, the resurrection of the Christ, and him now sitting upon his throne. Joel is talking about this particular time period. Um, it's not going to happen before the Messiah is sitting on the throne. It's going to happen after it. Um, it is not something that was going to be done to God's people while they were still the Israelites. It would happen to the new nation that he will make a new covenant with. All right, and so Joel is saying that this is going to happen. It shall come to pass in the last days. Now, what is so impressive about this is that it says what's going to happen. It says this, the, he says the, that God would, he would pour out what? His spirit on, and this is a very important part of it, all flesh. Up until the time that we're now in, the people of God were the children of Israel. But the, 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 the concept of him pouring out his spirit upon all flesh is now the idea that everybody is subject to salvation. Everyone can now come to him. Now, obviously it's not going to be talk, he's not for saying that, he's not saying that every single person will receive the Spirit of the Lord because not everybody obeys the gospel. You know, we understand that. But there is a pouring out of his Spirit upon all flesh. I think the idea here is that now he's making his Spirit available to all, to all who would listen, to all who would come to him. But it's, it's more than that, though. All right? The Holy Spirit plays a very important part in the working of the first century the church. The, the Holy Spirit would reveal the will of God to the people. You know, Jesus promised his apostles that this is what would happen. But there would be a second part, and that would be the Holy Spirit would do various signs and miracles that would confirm that the message that was being taught was from God. That's what Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, specifically 3 and 4, talks about. Or actually, verses 1 and 2. How that all the words that Christ taught has been verified to us and have been confirmed to us by God. So, what we're looking at here, don't take this as being figurative. Uh, in a sense that they're literally, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Which Bible character had seven daughters who had the gift of prophecy? Was it Philip? 
If memory serves correctly, I need to look at that. Um, there were prophets in the first century. When we said, when in preparation of this, I learned something that I guess I had overlooked for all these years. Judas, no, sorry. Silas was a prophet. Okay? And there were other prophets. There were, uh, there were uh, when, when Paul and... Um, Si and Paul and Barnabas are being chosen, and then Paul and Silas. There's a reference there. There's other prophets there. So, so you're going to have these miracles being done. When you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you're going to have individuals who had the gift of prophecy, who had the gift of knowledge. This was the Holy Spirit being poured out on all flesh. Now, it is important to point out that he doesn't talk about how the Holy Spirit was going to be doing this. In other words, we know the apostles doing the laying on of hands. Look at Acts chapter 8 in regards to Philip um, and why uh, Peter and John had to go down through Samaria. They had to go down there because the Holy Spirit had not yet been received. They had not given the Holy Spirit through the laying on the hands. This was for the purpose of miraculous work. With Cornelius and his household, that was the other example where the Holy Spirit came upon the household without the laying on the hands. Peter observes that, and later in the next chapter, in chapter 11, says, it happened like it did in the beginning. You know, so it was showing that Gentiles were accepted by God. So, what we see here, Joel said, would happen. In this case in point, it is to be taken, you, you look around throughout the first century, and this is what was done. The Holy Spirit was poured out on in those days, and individuals were prophesying. Now, when you look at verses 19 and 20, um, not so much taking this as literal, so much so as it is a sign of the fact that things are changing. Uh, change was in the air, if you would, blood and fire, vapor, smoke. Sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Um, now, here's where we scratch our head a little bit and wondering what, what's Philip talking about, or Philip, what Peter's talking about here, and more what Joel's talking about. It could be the day of the Lord is referring to this day of Pentecost, because Christ is now reigning over his kingdom. Okay? Could be referring to that. And I say that because when, when did, the, when did the, the sun go dark just prior to this? At Christ's death. All right, so that could be looking at the death of Christ. That would need to happen before the great coming awesome day of the Lord. That'd be Jesus reigning over his kingdom now in his throne. Um, and it is at this time, and it shall come to pass, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Um, and the, the day of the Lord is a very interesting concept, especially when you look through, um, you study through Luke. Because there are sometimes the day of the Lord is referring to judgment. Other times it looks and sounds like it's talking about his establishment as king over his kingdom. Where everyone would now become accountable unto him. Everyone would be without excuse. They would choose to follow him or not follow him. And in this case in point, if that's what he's talking about, then on this very same day, we now have that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Any thoughts or comments about that? So to Jack and the cow. So when they were speaking, my thought is that the Holy Spirit was involved being able to converge and the language that they were hearing, but they were able to understand it in their own language. I don't know what else it could be other than the Holy Spirit. It had to be the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. It had to be the Holy Spirit. Uh, it said to, to, uh, to get out God's good word. That's exactly right. Yeah. And by, by, you know, you think about how quickly this would spread if the Holy Spirit was not aiding it. The apostles would teach a small group of people every first day of the week and then have some studies with them. That would be a slow process of, of spreading the word. But with the Holy Spirit inspiring other people to be able to teach as well, then you could have a congregation where an apostle hasn't visited since it was established and still the truth be taught from week to week and being learned week to week. You know, with, with the various gifts involved there. Only by, like you said, the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, any other thoughts or comments before we talk about this last phrase here? Okay. 
that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Remember, this is what Joel said would happen. Um, the key word in that phrase is whoever. Okay, that's the first key word. Because prior to this point, Gentiles were not subject to the law of God. Children of Israel were the people of God. Whoever now expands it to all. Okay, the Spirit of the Lord be poured out on all flesh. It is that concept. Everyone would now have this opportunity. The phrase, call on the name of the Lord, we'll talk more about this next week. Consider it as an official appeal to God for help. Okay, it's much more than what some people would say that it is today. You are turning to God for help, and now you have to do what God has told you to do. It's appealing to Him. So, we'll pick up with that um, next Lord's Day morning. Verse 21 Look at who calls on the name of the Lord, shall we say, Paul will use this again in Romans chapter 10, if memory serves correctly. And then we'll continue with verse 22. Appreciate all your participation and comments.